This presentation isn't as pretty as the others you'll see today and tomorrow. It's the first time I've talked on it, so I don't have lots of nice pictures. But I, I do have words, so let's start with the words. I'm going to try to combine three ideas in this talk. One is this common idea in economic theory, at least, that a good proxy for the health of a city is the total sum of the property values in the city. Uh, there are caveats, but that's at least a common heuristic. Number two, I'm going to invoke the idea that I have pursued for a long time of decision market, a certain way to use financial speculation to make decisions when you have some sort of ex post measurable outcome. And that might be the total value of property in a city. And third, I'm going to combine that with Harburger taxes and argue that a certain variation on Harburger taxes, which a conditional variation, allows for a finer grain measuring of the total property value of a city and therefore allows this general decision market mechanism to have a wider scope of application in changing city land use rules. So that's what I'm going to talk about. So I'm not going to describe any proofs or theorems or lab experiments or statistical analysis. It's just walking through it conceptually, trying to see what would work. So the first concept is an old one in economic theory. Imagine a city where a bunch of people could move to the city, but they've got other places they could go. Many other resources in the city are supplied competitively, but land is inelastic. And in that sort of scenario, then when you do something better in the city, more people want to move there. The other inputs are still supplied competitively. And then rents go up. And the improvement in the rents is reflecting the fact that the city is a more attractive place to be. Now, there are uh, obstacles to that. Uh, rent control, moving costs, market power, other kinds of rents, et cetera, can get in the way of that direct connection. But it's still a provocative heuristic that you might want to use. And given how badly city governance often goes, you might not think it wouldn't be such a terrible thing if you just consistently approved policies that increased the total property value in the city. That might not be so bad, even if it's not perfect. All right. The second idea I'm combining here is something I'm calling, I've called decision markets, uh, also under the name Futarchy for grandiose applications. This is a mechanism for making uh, governance decisions. Uh, the key thing you need to start with is some measure x, which is measurable after the fact. You could think of it as like GDP. For a firm, it could be the stock price in the future, plus dividends. Uh, but you need some measure after the fact of what was good or bad. So this is your thing you're trying to improve. You're trying to choose policies that make x bigger. You need a measure like that. And of course, we could think of total property value as a measure like that. Then you're imagining there's some sort of agenda mechanism. And a new agenda item shows up on the agenda, a bill B. And we're going to have two events. Either we pass the bill or we don't pass the bill. And of course, we're asking, which of those events do we want to have happen? We like a decision process for choosing B or N. So the process recommended here is to first create four kinds of assets which are distinguished by whether they pay in units of 1 or units of x. <laughs> They'll pay in dollars, but one might pay $1 and one might pay x dollars, where x is this ex post measure. And they'll also vary in whether they're conditional on the event b or the event n. So one, of, one asset is pays in x dollars if b, and then a nearby asset pays in $1 if b. Uh, now, the next thing you do after making these four assets is get a market in trading them. So the key idea is if we have a market that trades x if b for 1 if b, and there's a market ratio of those trades, that price is a, can be reasonably interpreted as a market estimate of the expected value of x given b. Expected value in probability terms weighted by, say, however this unit asset dollar might change over states, but still roughly an expected value of x if b. We can do the same thing for n. Uh, and there's a mistake there. <laughs> it's x dollars if n and one dollar if n. And we can get another market that gives us a price that estimates x, the expected value of x if n. And now the key recommendation is, if these are different prices, and the first price is significantly different than the second one, that's a recommendation that this is a good bill. It's good in the sense that speculators estimate that if we pass the bill, that x will be higher. And x is the thing we've decided we want. Uh, now, uh, as, as caveats, if you make this too strict a thing, uh, you can have some problems. So you might want just some tendency, some perhaps strong tendency, to pick uh, the first option if it's higher. But some randomness is OK and even beneficial. Uh, and you can uh, therefore allow other, other things to influence this. And, and of course, 
whether two prices are different is, is a statistical thing in the sense that prices fluctuate and you, the question is what time period are you averaging over? And it might be that although one looks a little bigger, it's not really significantly different, bigger. And then you, in that case, you might say, no, we'll pass. It's not clearly better. So, but if one price is clearly higher than the other over whatever period you picked, then that's recommendation. And then you might pick a decision mechanism that tended to adopt that policy when the market suggests it. So this is a way that you can get market speculators to give you advice on what to do. Uh, now, obviously, as was previously mentioned about manipulation, many people want one decision or another to happen, and they would be tempted to manipulate these markets. And there's a literature on manipulation in speculative markets that suggests, as mentioned earlier, that in fact, this sort of manipulation makes the prices more accurate because people expect manipulation, and then that changes their trading behavior. They're more eager to trade because they hope to profit against the manipulators. Uh, so in fact, it cuts errors. There is a spe particular literature on these conditional markets, which is different than a generic speculative market, that suggests if you just have one trader, uh, they are biased in the sense that they would rather uh, make the market look like the option uh, should happen, which is the one they have more information about, because they're going to get paid in proportion to how much information they have about that option. And when there is only one trader, you might not get good revelation here. But there's some lot of experiments and theories suggest that two or more traders, <laughs> you have enough competition to get rid of that sort of effect. And so you can get good estimates here. So um, this is the decision markets mechanism, which is uh, promising, I think, but still under tested. It's been tested a bit in the lab. Uh, you can argue for it, but it's very, very little field testing. All right. Now, again. There's this issue of, well, how do we, what do we use for x? You could say we should use property values, but how do we measure city property values? That's pretty noisy in the sense there's all these different trades. They happen infrequently. There's tax breaks. There's other compensating parts of, of deals. Uh, how do we get a good estimate of the value of property in a city? So that's where Harburger taxes might come in. So to review, you just heard a quick summary of it before. I'll give you a little more notation. Uh, it's a system wherein every property owner, every property at every moment in time has a declared value, D. And you're allowed to, declare your, to, to change your declared value at any moment you want, raise it or lower it. But uh, you will pay a property tax over time, which is the integral of this declared value over time, times a tax rate, R, which, as was mentioned, is good if R is near the turnover rate. This can, in principle, apply to many kinds of property, which is interesting. I'm focused here on land uh, for the purpose of city uh, land use, and so I'll just focus on land. Uh, good things about the Harburger tax, uh, it induces people to produce a D in general near their private value. Uh, it allows better allocation of property at a sometimes a cost in investment. Uh, it can replace eminent domain as a way to allocate property. Uh, you might fear, yes, but somebody could take my property. But that will only happen if they've made a cred credible demonstration that they value it more than you. So as an efficiency economist, I can't really sympathize too much with your desire to keep something when somebody else values it more than you. But that's me. And uh, many people are excited about this sort of thing, in part because of what they could do with all the extra tax revenue. I'm not arguing about <laughs> that. You could redistribute back to other, the same sort of people or put it, use it, substitute other taxes. So it's less about, for me, the tax revenue, the more about the efficiency here. There are a number of subtleties in terms of, uh, well, how quickly do you get the property? What's the default terms of that transfer? Uh, can you quickly buy it back with, by avoiding transaction costs? How do you inspect the quality of something you'd like to buy but aren't sure about things? Uh, you, can you set a different price for bundles? Uh, things like that. So there's a number of subtleties, but I still think it has a lot of, a lot of promise. But notice this slide is 3A. 3B here is the variation that's new. So everything I've said so far is uh, not new. This is the new thing that I've only ever talked about now, which is conditional harbor taxes. So it's very similar to the harbor taxes, except it's based on conditions. So now imagine we have a Bill B, which proposes some change in land use rules. It might be a zoning variance, uh, tax, you know, all sorts of changes you can imagine. And we're going to try to use this decision markets process to make that kind of a decision uh, and take it out of the realm of politics. As you may know, zoning process is very political today. It's very expensive and awkward exactly because of it. its being political and arguably quite inefficient. OK, so the new thing is they're going to have, again, an agenda process that will put a zoning variance proposal on the agenda, a Bill B. And you might even do this to be concrete by an auction for each slot. You have a bunch of time slots. In each slot, there's one bill proposed. And you've paid, you bid the auction price, so you get your bill on the proposal, on the agenda. And again, we have the event B, where the bill is passed, the event N, where the bill is not passed. 
And we should have some sort of process by which when a bill gets on the agenda that might affect your property value, you get told about it and there's straightforward ways to do that. But now the key idea is you were the owner of a property before and you are now the conditional owner under two conditions. You are all now the B owner and the N owner. You own the property if the bill passes and you own the property if the bill doesn't pass. And these are separate property rights that you can sell separately. You can sell someone in the conditional ownership and then if you sell them the B ownership and then the B passes, they become the, B on the or ordinary owner. If you sell someone the N ownership and the bill doesn't pass, they become the N owner. So it's a conditional ownership that transfers. And now we do the conditional harbinger tax, which is you must, each conditional owner must declare value. And by default, you know, your, your value is whatever it was before, you haven't changed it, but once you become the conditional owner, the default is still the old declared value, but you are now allowed to declare a new conditional value. You're allowed to say, well, if this bill passed, then my property is worth more or my property is worth less. And you will pay the conditional harbor tax in the units of conditional cash. You can just wait till the event and see whether you have to pay or not. It's a conditional payment based on a conditional fee. And that's the idea of conditional harbor taxes. And we can combine this with the decision market idea because we can now compare, for each property, there's, there's two prices there, and then we can look at the difference, and we can add up those differences, right? So for most properties, there won't be any difference. They won't have bothered to declare a difference. But for some properties, somebody will have declared a different value if the thing is passed and a different value if it doesn't pass. There'll be a difference in those numbers. We can add up those differences, and that's a estimated difference in the total to three property value. Uh, given the bill passes or not. So this is a good first cut. It's not quite right, but it's a good first cut way to think about how you could use conditional harbor taxes as a way to estimate whether a bill will increase or decrease property values in a city. And the key idea here is, since every property always has one of these declared values, we don't have the problem of whether how recently a price was measurement or whether that price takes into account a bunch of other features is just a number on every property all the time, and so we can just add those up all the time, and we've got a more precise estimate here. But this does have one problem, which is manipulation. Uh, you'll notice that the heart, now you'll notice that each person, say if there's a bill and it's gonna benefit them, they'd like to exaggerate that benefit so that it passes and benefits them, and if it's gonna hurt them, they'd like to exaggerate that harm so that they prevent the bill from passing. And so there is an incentive to exaggerate on both sides uh, on the gain or the loss. Um, now, this Haberger tax system actually is pretty good at disciplining you on exaggerating going low. If you make your declared value too low, somebody will grab your property and you won't have it anymore and that will be a big cost to you. So, and they might well just grab it and expect to sell it back to you and say, come on, that wasn't, you weren't serious, really. And, and that sort of speculation would also happen and that would also discipline you. So you really wouldn't go too far low in underestimating your declared value because someone could grab it, especially a conditional thing. You say, if this passes, that's just terrible for me. And somebody says, no, that's not so bad. I'm going to take your property under that condition. And they will be happily express their value that that's not so bad for you. The problem is these taxes don't so much discipline an excess valuation. If you, if you state your value too highly just because you want to pass some bill, other people aren't going to, you know, what can other people do? You state your value too highly, you pay a higher tax for a short time, but that's not very big punishment. So to fix this problem, I'm going to switch to uh, a slight variation, which is a purely financial asset. Because with a purely financial asset, we can get speculators on both sides that discipline your price being wrong in either direction. What financial asset can I pick? Well, you, if you declare a value on your property, there's this tax you have to pay. And we can, inter we can collect that tax into an account, and you can have a right to that account. So with every Harburger tax, there's a tax revenue account, which is where all that tax money goes. And owning a fraction of that is a financial asset. And now it'll be much harder to manipulate the value of that financial asset. So for every property, we're going to have this financial asset, which is the rights to all the future taxes from that asset, or some percentage of that. Now this is an asset that can be speculated and created in infinite supply. People can buy or sell. Anybody can come in and buy or sell. And now speculators can discipline efforts to manipulate those prices. Now, usually you just have automated programs that set the price of this uh, revenue asset very close to the price of the declared value, because usually they would just track each other. It's not that hard. The main reason you would ever make them different is when you suspect manipulation, <laughs> when you think somebody is actually trying to push a decision by excess, by raising their declared value too high. 
So it's not that much of a burden to the uh, processes that estimate these prices for the declared for the tax revenue assets. They're mostly just tracking the declared values, which are there all the time anyway. So now we've got an asset that's hard to manipulate. <laughs> But it does the, basically the same thing, and now we can do the same sort of process. For every property, we look at the difference between the tax asset price conditional on the bill passing minus the tax asset price conditional on the bill not passing, add up those differences, and when that's positive, that's suggesting you should pass this tax bill. It's on average good, and then you should have a noisy process whereby then you have a much higher chance of passing that bill if that's true. So that's the refined proposal that I offer for your serious consideration as a way to make property land use decisions, or regulatory decisions, such as zoning variances, in a regulatory context. Let me give you just two conceptual examples, They're relatively simple. Here's nine properties. And in the middle, somebody has a store, and they've got a parking rule that they says they have to have so many parking spaces, and they're almost always empty. And they say, come on, let me build something else on my lot and have fewer parking spots. And they declare that at the moment, their property is worth 10, but if you let them build more, their property is worth 25. Now, other people nearby, they go, oh, you know, if these people have a lower property parking requirement, when in the Christmas season or something, parking may spill over into my lot, and that'll make my lot less valuable. My lot's going to be a little less valuable because of this new real pass, so they start to lower it. So the ones that are immediately in the neighborhood, they go down by two from 10 to eight. The ones that are a little farther away go down to nine. And farther away, nobody bothers to pay attention to this because it's too, too small to bother, and they don't leave any changes. So we just add up all the ones that are different. And in this case, the bill passes. And so then uh, this guy gets a property advantage, and the other guys get a thing. Actually, um, I, I should have mentioned, well, so there's this issue of do we allow changes in governance such that some people get hurt? The fact in the world today is, yes, we do. We, we consistently allow a lot of changes in governance, such that some people get hurt. But you could wonder, is that a good idea? Uh, and so one thing you could do is just set a, a limit on the maximum loss anybody could suffer. That would be one way to do it. There are, you could set some average loss, some average of the loss relative to gain. You could just set some mathematical constraint on losses. And that would limit how much anyone might lose under one of these proposals. You say, yes, on average, that's a win, but the, the, the distribution is bad. Come back with a new proposal where you add a tax, you add something such that the losers win something, and then we'll pass you. Um, so, and then another more motivating example here. Imagine we've got a property and we've got a place and we want to say, let's make that place a park. Now it's a underdeveloped, empty lot, but uh, that would be a good park. And you know what? The neighbors nearby, they go, yeah. A park next door, good deal. So they raise their values, you can see here, from 10 to 12 or 10 to 11. And the guy in the middle goes, uh, well, you know, my, my property is not worth anything you turn into a park. And so now we'll have the decision, do we turn this into a park? And now this is, of course, a way this one guy could lose big. Now you might imagine changing the proposal such that, OK, we, we give a special payment to this property as part of the proposal, and that's paid for by these other guys, and, we, and now everybody has to reevaluate that. Uh, you could also do, if you think about it, more detailed services. So you might have, OK, there's a park, and we're going to this bill is going to define what the responsibilities of the park manager is. And now you can bid to be the park manager, and that number could be negative. You could say, I require the following payment to be park manager, include, and then I get the rent, the Harburger rents are negative rent, so I get the, the initial payment plus the payment over time as my payment for being the park manager. And you, now you're basically putting in an auction for who wants to manage the park according to whatever the rules are. OK, so um, that's basically my talk. Uh, the concept here, again, is three ideas put together. One is a uh, standard idea, um, maximizing property value as a heuristic for good decisions for cities. Second, this idea of a decision market, which is you have some value x you're trying to estimate, you want to improve. You have speculative markets where you bet on x conditional on making a change, x conditional on not making a change. If the difference of there is substantially different, you make the approval. That's something I think is interesting in general. And thirdly, the, the problem with that is that the noise could be too high. You measure your of x might be noisy, and then you clearly can't make decisions that have impact that's smaller than the, the, your noise in the measure of x. Here's a way to get much more precise measures of x, which is total city property values. First, Harburger taxes give it a number on everything, always there. And uh, the only disadvantage is there's an incentive to manipulate by raising uh, temporarily raising your declared value to make something pass. And uh, we switched to this other uh, 
tax revenue asset in order to get that. Is this a hint or? <laughs> I think someone's trying to join this. Uh, join, okay, there's a flashing light up there, I think, on the camera, so. <laughs> anyway, but that's the end of my talk. <laughs> So I had a, a comment and a question. So I think that my comment is, I'm not sure if you thought of maybe an additional advantage of your scheme, is that if you maximize the present value of current housing stock, then you run into, I guess, the San Francisco problem, where people are blocking new construction because that keeps their land value side. But I think that your mechanism actually solves this problem. Because if you're betting on discounted tax revenue for the entire place, then you actually have the extensive margin as well. And sort of, it is hard to maybe have bets on hard worker valuations for properties that don't exist, but sort of the tax revenue of an area as a whole is something you can conceivably bet on and actually takes into account new construction. You would certainly want the scope of this calculation to be as, as wide spatially as you could conceivably go near the city. You wouldn't just want to have the inner city, say, or just the a district. You, you'd want to, for, for welfare mapping, right. you would yeah. want to go as wide as you could. Yeah, but I, I guess I'm saying sort of uh, the sort of betting on future discounted rental, uh, sorry, sorry, um, tax revenue is actually a clean way to do that, which is an additional benefit. <laughs> but I think sort of maybe a caveat is it seems like a tough speculative sort of arbitraging a difference between a discounted future ex a sort of profit stream and sort of a current prediction market price seems like uh, sort of you might write into liquidity constraints trying to arbitrage that well. So are you talking about actually buying the property as part of your arbitrage? I guess sort of the what guarantees convergence of the futures market pr prices to the discounted sort of tax revenue stream is someone actually doing that arbitrage? And so you need a lot of capital for a long time to sort of bet on a future discounted stream of profits. Well, if, if, you, if you think the errors are in the future, then you have to wait for those errors. Yeah, but yeah. you don't need a lot of money in the sense these are speculative financial markets that you can buy $10 worth if you want, as long as the transaction costs allow it. So, so as, as financial assets, there's very low transaction costs. If you actually had to buy the physical property, then there'd be a lot of transaction costs to arbitrage. And that's the whole magic of the tax revenue assets. <laughs> There's very low transaction costs on those. You don't have to manage a property. You don't have to do anything with the property. You just buy or sell the shot fraction of the, of the tax revenue asset. Yeah. No, I guess what I'm saying is even as a purely financial asset, you need to take a, a position in sort of two, uh, sort of, you have to arbitrage two financial assets, but you have to hold both that position for many years too, which may work, but it's a. You, presumably, what you want to do is buy lots of property yeah. <laughs> rather than just one if you think there's overall mistakes. If there's a mistake being made somewhere, it's probably not just in one property in one yeah. case. It's probably being made in lots of properties, lots of cases, so then you want to do all of them at once. Question. Yeah, I, I have two. I have two quick questions for I have two quick questions. So the, um, they're probably because I'm not smart enough. So please, you know, feel feel free. Um, to shut those down. So, so the first one is that in, in financial economics, um, I think people are really aware now that it really matters who trades in markets, right? So if you think about these decision markets, one thing that just kind of popped into my head head is say you want to maximize so your X, as you call it, right? Is like the, uh, the entire city's property values or something like that, right? So that, has, that was your example, right? So I assume there are kind of you know two types of participants in that part that you know could participate there, right? So one is a single mother with three children that has I don't know you know three jobs, right? And one is Donald Trump, right? So Donald Trump is going to participate in that market, right? And it's all his friends because you know they're going to benefit more, arguably, you know, from higher property values, for example, right? So don't you run into this problem that essentially you know what's going to happen in practice is that all the market participants are going to be people that are going to benefit more from whatever X is because other people don't have time or the resources? Well, so this is the issue of manipulation that was discussed earlier. Uh, when you are trading a financial asset, uh, one motivation you have is your pure personal financial return. Is the price too low or too high? If it's too low, I buy, too high, too, too I sell. You might say there's this other incentive that the price will affect something else in the world that you care about. And so the idea that you would trade in order to gain those other effects is the idea of, manip of trade manipulation that was talked about before. And the evidence is that it's very hard to manipulate in, in effect. In, in speculative markets, i.e. where anybody can take any side and anybody in the world can trade, it's very hard to manipulate. And we have theory and lab experiments <laughs> and field data that all suggest uh, 
in fact, that when you add people who might want to manipulate, it makes the prices more accurate on average, in fact, not less. Right. I, I, guess, I guess it's slightly, I mean, in my head, at least, it's slightly different from manipulation because what I mean is just assuming that you know, a higher X benefits people in an unequal way, right? So I think that's, that's different from manipulation, right? If you just select for certain oh. groups of people to participate in the market, other people just do not participate in the market at all. Right? So there's, there's two issues. If you choose an X that benefits Trump, then the market will choose policies that benefit Trump because it's just trying to tell you what will produce X. So, so that's in the choice of the X. So, but the choice of the X is separate from the choice of speculators' prices that tell you which X will have a better effect, which trade bill B versus not will have a better effect on the X. And so for that, we have good, strong data of many sorts that suggest that just because you have an interest. So for example, in political betting markets, we've had betting markets say where most of the traders were Republicans. But the market wasn't pro-Republican. It still gave a pretty accurate estimate of, of whether a Republican or a Democrat would win the presidential election because each trader was not trying to produce the outcome they wanted. They were betting on what they thought would actually happen, which was, in that case, you know, which party's going to win. Right. Well, OK. Fair. So just a, a, a quick concern is, do you think that there's a potential monopoly problem in the sense of, suppose we think of, just to simplify things, we aggregate the whole city, it's just one property owner and it's trying to maximize the value of its property. We might imagine that, um, you know, it's San Francisco, San Francisco, everything's a mess there. Can't help but think about these problems in that frame. Um, Suppose I am the I am the owner of San Francisco, and so we're going to decide whether or not policy X is going to maximize my property values. Is there a reasonable scenario where, um, from a policy or social perspective, we might say that we want to set the number of housing units to be at the level of the marginal cost of providing housing units to provide as many housing units for people who want to be there? But in terms of maximizing my own value, I might want to collect a monopoly rent by setting the number of housing units less than that. So wouldn't this mechanism basically, um, basically choose the revenue maximizing to me monopoly quantity of housing to produce rather than the more socially efficient price equals marginal cost quantity of housing? So, so my first slide was about this heuristic of maximizing property values, and I said explicitly, well, it's, it's heuristic in the sense that it's not absolutely always the thing that would be best. And uh, you, you may be trying to point to cases where that would be true. Where, uh, yeah. But uh, I also said that in actual practice, say in San Francisco or even New York, actual choices about these zoning variances, et cetera, are so bad <laughs> that we might do pretty well by just maximizing property values for a while at least. I mean, what, if we got to the Nirvana where we were doing an excellent job of maximizing property values, then we might start to talk about other things we want in this outcome X, and that would be fine. Uh, but I would think at the moment we're just not close enough to, so again, you know, uh, again, we don't have the monopoly rent problem because there isn't a single owner for most of these major cities, and so uh, in fact, each individual property is a monopolist, but uh, overall there's a pretty competitive supply of the land that's available. Uh, and so I wouldn't actually think that's a, you know, in, in general, you should solve the problem you're in front of. <laughs> so there's, there's a world of problems you could solve if, if the problems you face were to go away and not be problems anymore. Good to keep those in mind, but first solve the problem that's right in front of you. I'd say the problem that's right in front of us now is we make a lot of really crappy city land allocation rules, use choices. And uh, this could do that in a simple, straightforward way. So I, I could imagine adding things to this measure uh, of property values to do slight improvements, but I worry about adding messy, noisy things that make it hard for us to just do the basics right. Um, so well, this is a bit of a follow-up on the last question. Um, so when you first uh, opened this Talk, you were talking about how one of the benefits of your idea is that it 
gets around the political mess that is zoning regulations. And given the discussions that have come up now, I'm curious whether you're worried at all that actually you're not getting around the politics, but just displacing the politics into different kinds of questions. For example, displacing politics into the question of what measure we should use, how to choose X, or for example, how to think about manipulation in different contexts and what kinds of manipulation we're going to look for. I'm curious how you think about that. Well, so this is the general mechanism philosophy of solving social problems. You have a political debate over choosing a mechanism, and then once you choose a mechanism, you try not to change that mechanism in each case. In each case, you use the mechanism, and then if you're going to lobby for something, you lobby within the mechanism for each case. So here, in the example of the park, say, or the, or the parking variation, there would be politics in the sense that uh, if I don't like this new parking lot, Thing I expect, I will try to go to my neighbors and lobby them. Hey, you know, lower your conditional property values. Let's get this thing killed. And you would have politics of that form, or even okay, I'm build, crafting this bill on parking. But who else could I have in the line with? I'm going to package my parking variation with some other variation that some other local property value owner will like, and then we'll get a bigger coalition together to resist this other stuff. So this mechanism has a form of politics that happens within it. It's just arguably a better political mechanism. <laughs> to be doing politics, but almost any big decision that affected a lot of people where some people got pissed, there would be, they would be using whatever politics they can. But the hope is you could channel them through the existing mechanism. Each time there was a parking, you know, zoning variation, they wouldn't change the whole rules of society. They would keep the current system, like we might do with the zoning system, and just lobby within that. And then we asking, if we could keep people lobbying mostly to within a system, what would be the better system? But you would certainly have to allow uh, and expect people will do everything they can within whatever system you offer them. But the question is, can you keep some parts of the system like hard to change so that they stay within that system usually when they make other choices? That, that's the idea of a mechanism. If you can't do that, you don't have the idea of a mechanism. There, there is no, everything is just always up for grabs, and there, there's no point in designing mechanisms, basically. Um, so in, let's say in the park uh, example, the, the final one, you know what? What are the arguments for and against uh, compensating the, uh, the, the owner of the property that's now a park? Um, the simple argument is it would just go much better if only proposals that ever passed always benefited everybody. right? You would definitely solve a lot of political problems. <laughs> you could make sure that every change was guaranteed to benefit everybody. Uh, the problem is it just might be really hard to craft such things. You, you might make a guess that this looks like it'll benefit everybody, and then the prices come in, and there's still five people who lose, and, they, and now it's vetoed, and we go, well, we just can't pass anything with this mechanism, right? So uh, I think the trade-off would be, can we find a way to make usually not very many people lose very much, but still pass stuff, have stuff allowed to change? And of course, this is the standard choice people made in what percentage of a legislature do you need to pass a bill, right? Ideally, it, you know, you'd like 100%. So now every bill that passes, everybody benefits. It's always great, but now, you know, it's now really hard to get past anything, and that's the same sort of trade-off here. Uh, I'm curious if you do you think that there's additional applications for the system that you've designed in other contexts, like take uh, like license models, for example, uh, just as sure. I guess as a thought experiment. Uh, in a pre-Uber and Lyft era, if we're talking about like the taxi medallion model, uh, harbor taxes seem like an interesting mechanism to incorporate into that, but then you also have the issue of uh, what is the actual supply of the number of licenses available, and then you apply that system into that context where maybe the thing, maybe the X that you're trying to, maybe the heuristic you're using is the value of the medallion itself, but then you also have the harbor tax to uh, kind of like limit propping up the value of the medallion, but then you also have the decision market mechanism for determining, oh, when is it a good time to actually like increase the supply because you want more drivers available, something like that? So, so just before uh, the session, we were talking about uh, spectrum auctions. And you could imagine using a harbor tax for a spectrum auction. And one of the critiques is, ah, but there's interference between properties. Uh, there are effects. But of course, that's what zoning is all about, is the interference between land properties. And this is a mechanism for trying to get that interference right. So uh, you could use this sort of mechanism to try to get interference right. <laughs> in spectrum property, say, and then you could be using a harbor tax to generically allocate property and allow it to be easily repackaged 
together with a system like this for choosing better properties to deal with interference issues. You were, in response to the previous question, uh, characterizing the objective of trying to reduce or minimize the amount of losses, even if you couldn't get that everybody wins. Sense of the political system I live in is that it's all about some people trying to impose losses on others to increase their gains. It's all about redistribution. It's not about uh, trying to be efficient. So the takings limitation that was mentioned before is exactly a rule intended to prevent it losses. It's not observed in the court system. They're taking my property right now. <laughs> I'm not compensating for it. Right. So, so we are collectively hypocritical in that we give lip service to this ideal of trying to make wins go and compensate the losers. But in fact, when we can get away with punishing our opponents and making them lose, we kind of like that. And so that's the world we live in. So I will appeal to your first part of your hypocritical split <laughs> to try to <laughs> avoid those conflicts. But uh, hey, if you can figure out a way that this will help you beat on your opponents, then I guess you might like it that way. Hi, thanks for the proposal. Um, I'm wondering, um, but every policy or a lot of policies come with certain network externalities, and I was wondering what degree of rationality you impose basically on all the neighbors. So, given your park or parking example, uh, when, once there's a, like a, the parking place diminished, then obviously people will incorporate the effect on their property, but the neighbor's properties decrease in value may have another feedback loop on your property, right? And so I, I was wondering um, if you could elaborate on that a little bit. Well, so in general, with uh, voting systems or even quadratic voting systems, we have the general problem of whether any one person who's affected to a small degree will make a good rational choice about their contributions, right? Um, one general hope we might have is that there's a way to create agents who will help you with those tasks that you could uh, trust. So here, I think there's a good prospect for agents in the sense that, OK, there's bills that come up, and I'm supposed to wonder if I'm supposed to change my conditional offers or not. And maybe I just hire an agency to manage that for me. And you know, if they have a percentage of cut of my property, that might get, or even an option on my property, that might be able to give them a good incentive to make those choices for me well in a way that it might be difficult if it's just I'm hiring somebody to help me vote. I mean, how do I give them a share of my voting gains, right? Uh, say if I'm a for-profit company, I could give them a share of the company, and that might give them incentives. But for most people, it's hard to actually set up an agency contract for somebody else to give you good advice on how to vote in a generic way. But here, I think you could more specifically set up an agency contract tied to the value of your property. And you could say, help me set these conditional prices to manage my property, and you get a share. Um, so this question is kind of out of left field, and I think for all four of you maybe, uh, but I was recently looking at the um, UN uh, Declaration of Human Rights, and it, uh, concerning property, says uh, that one of the basic human rights is the right to property. Everyone has the right to own property alone, as well as in association with others. No one shall be arbitrarily deprived of his property. Um, and I think, first of all, there's a lot of critique of this uh, part of the UN Declaration of Human Rights. It's a very westernized notion, for one. Uh, but another, I, I guess my question is, you know, this is the session on property, so how do you feel that your proposals relate to this uh, human right? And, um, you know, I'm sure you're going to say it's not arbitrary. This is going to the most like the person who values it the most, and that makes it not arbitrary. But I would guess that a lot of people would feel it's pretty arbitrary anyway. I'll answer and invite the others to answer as well. Uh, in general, in the field of economics and law and economics, uh, what is property and what features property have is just generically up for grabs. That is, we decide, is intellectual property a property that should exist, does exist? Are URLs a property? Is a trademark a property? Uh, you know, is, when you own land, is the right to have a view not blocked property, the right to see the ocean a property? There are all these possible properties, and we discuss which should or shouldn't exist. And when we discuss that, we're allowing the possibility of it should or shouldn't exist. And if it shouldn't exist, we're deciding that's not a good thing to have as property. 
as a default thing that tied to that property. And then when we go to the UN, they say, we'd say, well, you have the right to whatever property we've decided is a good kind of property. <laughs> and you don't have a right to the other kinds of property because we decided those are not good kinds of property to have. I mean, that, that's kind of the way, I mean, and the UN will let, let us get away with that because they're, of course, they're just spitting out sort of general pablum, right? I mean, come on. I, I think maybe I should say something about that too. I, I think that um, you know, similar to what I said about justice earlier, and I agree with with Robin. I, mean, I think property is an interpretive concept. It's like the question is, what is property? And that's the question we're trying to answer answer here. So you know, the, the, what, what they're when there's when they make a proclamation like that, they're basically saying property is this good thing that we should that we should defend, but uh, but they haven't defined it, and um, you know. Uh, our job is to is to do that. I think uh, my side, basically, I think Matt's presentation captured what I view as a trade-off pretty well. Basically, I view the trade-off is basically between things that are the fruits of labor and things that are basically not, that are sort of classically lack. They're sort of inelastically supplied and just there. And I sort of think that if you can find anything which is purely the fruits of labor, which is hard to find, but for example, if someone is sort of freezing some water and making a nice sculpture or something, and you think water isn't very scarce, and so presumably philosophically somebody has a reasonable claim that that is essentially only the fruits of their labor, and thus they have a moral claim to that. But sort of, it's I think harder to justify that sort of the uh, airwaves, that sort of natural land or whatever, that anyone has any kind of moral claim to that, and then sort of, I think that sort of Thinking about radio spectrum as private property is maybe not the best way to think about it. Sort of, I think, uh, more if we care about basically maximizing sort of social efficiency and more naturally to allocate those things, is to sort of allocate the thing as best possible, as efficiently as possible, and divide the proceeds among the population. And then, sort of, proposals like harbor taxes or other uh, proposals start coming into play. I guess another thing to add on to that is sort of. What, the way we allocate things like radio spectrum and land in many countries have term limits anyways, so we are already not in the domain of full private property. And I think there are efficiency arguments for doing harbor or tax like schemes all along the spectrum of natural to fully natural to fully sort of like, um, private property, but I think at, at least at the end, the natural end of the spectrum, there are pretty good arguments that sort of the moral concerns are just maybe sort of spectrum isn't something we should think of as property in the normal sense. Yeah? I think there was a question here, and then Glenn. Oh, uh, sure, just a brief question. Um, could there possibly be a situation during the proposal process where you could have two proposals, where if you pass one, it's you know good for one individual, but if you pass both, then it's bad. And would there be a way to sort of handle these, I guess, uh, dilemma situations in the actual uh, proposal uh, process of going through them. I have specialized in combinatorial prediction markets. And you could, could certainly do combinatorial markets here, but I wouldn't recommend that. That's too much trouble. The simple solution is just to make sure each decision happens in a period of time when no other decision happens. So there's a day or an hour when a particular decision happens. You're deciding on that one now. And as long as we all know that, we can wait until that hour to find out what's passed or not, and then we can make our decisions at that point. So you, you want people to have enough notice, so you want to tell them about th that it's coming up on the agenda a week or a month or however in advance, but have a decision point where it's just one thing on the agenda at that point. And of course, that's what we do in Congress, right? Or, or in legislatures or state or city you know, boards. We have one proposal on the agenda at any one time, and if two things interact, we, we pay attention to that. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Um, so, Roman, I've always been curious how you think about the relationship between what I might call additive and discursive mechanisms. So, Scott Page has a really nice series of work about sort of like, you know, imagine that you have a bunch of people and they all have bits. One way to make a decision is we could all have like bits that are and, uh, like an unbiased signal of the true state of the world. Another way could be that like the true state of the world is like some really complicated XOR function, hierarchical XOR function of those bits. And like while it is true from a Bayesian perspective that there is some information encoded in each bit about the eventual thing, it's like unbelievably noisy and like gets you almost nowhere. Whereas if you just 
wrote out all the bits and ran the XOR function on them, you would get the answer with like certainty. So like those are two, that's like, you call it linear versus nonlinear, you know, functions of the information you collect. And it seems to me that like, you know, prediction markets do a really good job for the linear case. In the nonlinear case, the concern that I have about a prediction market is on the one hand, it's just like no reason to think it'll do a particularly good job relative to what's possible. But on the other hand, the fact that a prediction market exists creates a pretty strong incentive for people to keep their information as private information and use it to bet on the market. Whereas otherwise, they might have had a reason to just disclose it and you could get the, and, you know, the correct answer with certainty. And it seems to me there must be a trade-off between these. And in fact, if you look at the history of political philosophy, there's a huge amount of discussion about discursive methods. And we really don't have any mechanisms to do anything with that. And usually when I hear people critique prediction markets, I think what's in the back of their mind is that they would prefer a more discursive process. And how do you think about the trade-off between those? Um, uh, more thoughts than I have time for. <laughs> uh, one is that um, we just pretty much always do discourse, no matter what. But we also have other mechanisms. So at Congress, which passes a bill, uh, they talk a lot. But then there's a moment when the bill comes up and they vote on it. So you could say, well, it's all about this linear adding up of their votes. Uh, but of course, they're doing a lot of talking before they decide what their votes are going to be. So you could say the fact that there's this particular mechanism that makes the final decision doesn't mean they aren't talking. That, that I agree with, but there's something particular about prediction markets, which is different than, than the voting, which is that there's a clear reason why you would want to keep information private if there's a prediction so market. That's the that second thing I was going to mention. Yeah. So um, people, I mean, this is a common complaint economists have. People look at a mechanism like I'm describing, which is relatively transparent and, 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 and clear, and they say, ah, look, a thing can go wrong here in this mechanism. And then they have this default thing that happen, and their model of the default is nothing goes wrong there. And that's just crazy wrong. So whatever you're thinking of replacing a prediction market for, it's a complicated game with lots of strategy, where usually there's lots of incentives not to tell the truth or even lie. Uh, that's the existing fact for pretty much all the institutions you're familiar with, including Microsoft. They all have these contexts where people lie or don't tell the truth for good incentives. <laughs> And you're offering in this other institution where there are particular cases where you might want, want to tell the truth. But in fact, the best strategy usually is to um, keep your secret, trade on it, and then tell people your secret. So as you may know, one of the main things that limits your returns in financial markets is how long do you have to wait to get a return. So if you see a mistake and you trade on that and you think it'll be 10 years before the mistake is recognized and fixed, now you've got to lock up capital for 10 years, and that's a big opportunity cost. And so you'll have to have a pretty good opportunity to be willing to do that. But if you can see a mistake, trade on it, and then immediately tell people, and then they listen to you and they believe you, then the price gets fixed immediately. You get to undo your trade immediately. Your trade could only have taken an hour, very low opportunity cost. So if there's any possible way of telling people what you know and convincing them, then your incentive is to shut up about it, trade, and then tell. Uh, because that gives you overwhelmingly the maximum rate of return on your capital. Uh, so of course, the usual problem is the things you know when you tell people they don't believe you. And that's less about your keeping the secret than more about our difficulty telling each other things we know. Right. Um, um, well, maybe just I would ask one final question, and then okay. there's one. Okay. Hi. So I was curious about this part example, where you know it seems like it might be useful to have. Um, the guy who's in the middle, maybe like if this bill passes, then for like let's say the extra benefit that's given to the neighbors to be reallocated to the person in the middle. Have that be a rule where basically if someone's losing, then the benefits that are given to people in you know the, the overall like you know economy are also reallocated back to that person so they don't actually lose anything. And so I'm wondering if like if you have rules like this added to this game. Like, how resistant is the game to um, manipulation if you add these rules? Like, if you add other types of rules that are, like, also trying to, like, account for some of these, you know, discrepancies or, like, you know, that bad things that might happen? So the problem is if you just make the generic rule that after the fact we will look at these prices and decide who was a winner or a loser and pay them that way, now your incentive to set these prices is quite distorted <laughs> based on the expectation of the implementation of that rule. So a better approach 
is for the person doing this to try to estimate who's the winner or the loser and just put in a tax bill that says these people transfer that much to it as part of their proposal. And then each person is now estimating their value relative to that concrete transfer proposal. They're saying, okay, there's gonna, you know, they're gonna do more parking next to me, but I'll get another $1,000 a year, whatever it is. Uh, now what do I think the net effect of that is on my property? And if the people estimating did it right, uh, I won't lose anything or probably gain anything, but they probably won't get it exactly right. And the problem is then, what if I lose a little bit? Do we, are we gonna veto this that way? And so that was the whole point of trying to set limits on how much anybody loses. As long as you allow transfers as part of the proposals and you allow limits on who loses, um, you, you limit the loss. But you might have, so say in a neighborhood, we all know, you know what, there's gonna be a park here one of these days. And I'll bet whoever's lot they pick to make the park, they're going to lose a bit. I mean, they won't lose a lot, but they'll lose a bit. They'll probably be a net loser. So I should look ahead and pick somebody else's property <laughs> and propose a park there <laughs> so it doesn't happen to me. I mean, that's one of the kind of politics that would happen in this world <laughs> is you would try to make sure you weren't one of the net losers. And the, the existence of net losses is what fires that kind of political spirit. Uh, it makes people passionate and emotional about politics. Uh, but again, I don't know how to make it all go away, so I gotta, I'm going to leave some of it. But the status quo has a huge amount, so, you know, come on. What are you asking? All right. Um, I think we're getting close to our lunch. Ask your question. So, I, so, okay, so I'll ask my question. Um, everything that you have said, I was thinking of like a radical thought, which is um, we usually think of taxation as you tax and then you spend on whatever you raise the revenue on. And the only financial security that we allow in between is the government can raise debt. And the problem with debt is it's completely, as you know, informationally insensitive and so on. So it's kind of a boring security. And what the kind of the general theme of what you're trying to get at is that, let me say it and you tell me if, if it's going in the right direction. What we can do is the following. We can introduce, we can say, look, we have some tax rate. Let's say we agree on the tax rate to be 20 percent, whatever. And now the size of the tax revenue is basically a function of the size of the pie, economic pie that we can generate. So the total tax revenue is going to be the tax rate, which is I'm going to pay to allow voting on more, more, you know, tax rate because that creates problems. And we, we want to now maximize the size of the pie. That's basically, I think of what we're doing as gen, generally that exercise. So now let's take the, that size of the pie times the tax rate as the total revenue that's generated. Some of it is going to be spent. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to take an equity piece there, let's call it 10% of that piece. And it's an equity piece. Whatever 10% of the total pie times the tax rate is, I'm going to securitize it and give it to every citizen. And now they can vote on whatever policy you think is relevant. Um, that's a broader mechanism of just maximizing the size of the pie. I can make it a little bit more sophisticated by saying, look, you don't have to each vote yourself, but you can put your security into vanguards of the world who will become your agents to vote on your behalf so they can specialize in thinking about public policy and so on. Is that a general mechanism that might work for uh, going where you're so trying If to I understand you, you're alluding to a common suggestion, which I'm sympathetic to, but hasn't gotten much traction, of just having somebody own a city. <laughs> It's, it's an old idea that, hey, if, if, if there was an entity that owned the whole city, well, they'd have an incentive to uh, manage the city well. You're, and, you're uh, owning a fraction of the revenue stream that the city generates. That's basically Right, but you're creating this equity, which is ownerships in the city, and you're allowing it to collect into a small number of hands because on the economies of scale of management, and yeah. that's what ownership is, yes. Right. In general, when we have a firm, we have a lot of owners, and we have a central set of management who manage but, the but firm? We already have that. I'm institutionalizing that a bit differently, but we already have that in the form of you know, the government collecting taxes and so on. It's part owners, right? And we all... Yeah, yeah but the people running the government don't get a cut, right? <laughs> they make the government. If they make the government work better, they don't get a share of that, right? Whereas right. in an ordinary firm, the CEO gets a, a bigger cut of if the firms manage better, and that's supposedly a big advantage of the firm-based organization. So. I'm certainly sympathetic to the idea, hey, firms have good incentives, cities don't, so let's do cities like firms and have somebody own a city. I, I don't think that's crazy, but I can see a lot of resistance to that. This is a variation I think will produce less resistance, <laughs> but still give pretty good governance choices. That's okay. one last question. Just, question. Just a comment. Disney does own a city in Orlando, Indeed. Celebration, and I'm pretty sure that they've got 
full run of the house. So yeah. be, I don't know if anyone's done any studies on that, on, on your point. And the Medici back in Venice, and you know, there's a lot of history. <laughs> yeah. All right, thank you. But, I think thank we'll, you all. We'll, we'll, we'll close on that. Um, I wanted to say a few things actually before we go for lunch, because tomorrow the conference is going to be in uh, Princeton, and um, I wanted to make sure that for folks who are not going to be there, I recognize the people who helped so much in organizing this conference. Uh, so I especially uh, want to acknowledge uh, Nancy Turco, who's sitting in the back. <laughs> Violetta Rosenthal, who's sitting right here. And last, but certainly not the least, uh, Pallavi Luka, who's standing.